Back in the summer of 2020, I wrote this pandemic-inspired novella as a freebie for my newsletter subscribers. Over the past couple of years, as I've gotten more invested in audio production, this story continued to creep around in the recesses of my mind. It spoke to me over and over, and what it said was, You aren't done with me yet. So, dear readers and dear listeners, I present to you Disciples of Nergal in its newest and spookiest form. The all-new original music was provided by Shadow Lurker. The man behind the name has been my best friend since sophomore year of high school, and it's so awesome to still be creating content with him. He also created the Into the Gloom podcast music. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy the show. As a gift to all of you that buy my books and audiobooks, listen to my podcast, and leave reviews, I'm keeping this narration experience free. Share it if you like it, leave a Goodreads review once you finish, and most importantly, please, Remember to leave a light on. Chapter 1 A year ago, I would have said that possession is something only seen in the movies. I know better now, and I've got the scars to prove it. Supernatural forces are a reality I can no longer deny. The coronavirus pandemic changed a lot of things, but it's nothing compared to the horrors I experienced a few months ago in that godforsaken church. Before we go any further, I feel I need to get a few things out of the way for some context. I am not overtly religious, but I still consider myself a Christian. To be honest, this is a huge surprise after everything I've seen done by professed Christians. Add in the nightmare my crazy fundamentalist uncle put our family through, and it's a wonder I believe in God at all. I may get into that later. That's still undecided, as it's so painful to rehash. As I mentioned before, I'm not very religious, and what I mean by that is I don't regularly attend church services on Wednesday evenings or Sunday mornings. That being said... I was faithfully in synagogue each Saturday morning when I went through my Messianic Jewish phase, but that was all wrapped up in guilty feelings, fear, and law theology that I'd rather not get into now. The way I see it, there's a load of difference between being religious and being spiritual. My dad basically has the opposite experience as me. He is highly religious, attending church services and events on a consistent and weekly basis. But when it comes to the teachings of Jesus, he falls flat. He's judgmental, rude, and selfish. Now, before you get all judgmental, let me share a memory to help put my statement into context. This is one such story of many. A couple of years ago, I went with my dad to the grocery store. We were planning a small get-together, a barbecue in the backyard, and he wanted to buy a case of beer to supplement the liquor we already had in the garage freezer. We arrived at the grocery store, my dad speeding the entire way, and went inside. Walking through the entrance, we were hit with a wall of cool air that was invigorating after walking through the hot mugginess that characterizes an Alabama summer. The inside of the store was bright and pristine. Thousands of colorful products and advertisements fought for each shopper's attention. But my dad was unfazed, having a one-track mind set on beer, and beer alone. A decrepit old lady was walking out of the aisle we were headed to, and I slowed to let her pass. But my dad turned sideways and pushed past her, almost knocking her to the ground. Let me help you. I said, reaching my hand out to steady her by the shoulder. An interesting combination of mothball and rose petal wafted into my nostrils. The smell was so strong it was almost offensive. Oh my, she croaked while adjusting her glasses. Thank you, dear. Gaining her balance, she scooted toward the ten items or less checkout line. 
I caught up to my dad, who was then surveying the beer collection with deep concentration on his face. What the hell, Dad? I said. You almost knocked that little old lady down. He continued staring at the wall of cold beverages and lifted a hand to his mouth, eyebrows furrowed. I don't have time to wait for dying people to get out of my way, he said in his usual slow country drawl. We've got a lot to get done before people start arriving tonight. Are you thinking cans or bottles? I don't care. That was kind of a dick move. Will you get off my back? He said, finally turning his gaze to me. You're starting to sound like your mother. Whatever. I'll drop it, I said, rolling my eyes. He loved my mom, but the way he talked about her peeved me sometimes. Thank you kindly. I wonder if we should have went to the liquor store instead. His mind back on its one-track path. They've got that walk-in beer fridge at Marty's on 10th. A smile spread across his face, as if in a daydream. I bit down on my tongue, knowing that pushing the issue would only start an argument. Winning an argument with my dad was impossible, as he always had to have the last word. Not to mention his inability to take responsibility for anything he ever did wrong. He settled on beer, a 12-pack of both cans and bottles, and walked past me toward the checkout line. The little old lady was pulling out her purse to pay in the quick lane, and my dad veered himself her way. Two other registers were open, but there were families in both, with carts piled high. One of them had four small children hanging off the sides, flopping around like bacon in a hot pan. Their mother looked worn out and defeated. Her hair was haphazardly folded into a sloppy, uncentered bun, and her face was free from any makeup. Her two big sweatpants drooped down, revealing the bright purple of her underwear. She absentmindedly flipped the pages of a celebrity magazine as her kids made enough noise to wake the dead. The old lady in front of us continued to dig through her purse. Looks like your friend is just about to leave, my dad sneered over his shoulder. I rolled my eyes again. It was a common occurrence when we were together. I love my dad, don't get me wrong, but he drives me batshit crazy most of the time. His behavior was selfish, and I doubted whether he even knew the meaning of the word sympathy. And he was always in a rush. It stressed me out, made me anxious. I wondered if slow was a concept he was even aware existed. Real funny, Dad. We entered the line, and he hoisted the beer cases onto the conveyor belt. They slowly edged down toward the cashier, bottles rattling as they came to a stop. Oh, dear, the old lady said. I seem to have left my cash at home. She put a wrinkled hand to her face and shook her head back and forth as if not knowing what to do with herself. I leaned over toward my dad and quietly said, Why don't you pay for her stuff? We'll get out of here quicker. No, nah, screw that. It's not my fault she's too old to remember her wallet. I rolled my eyes for the third time since we'd entered the store. I sighed and stepped past my dad. Ma'am, I said, pulling my own wallet out. I can take care of this for you. Oh, that is so sweet of you, she said, beaming. Her words whistled through her thin lips. You've come to my rescue twice now. Bless your heart. I paid the cashier, the old lady thanked me, and then she headed out of the store. My dad shouted after her, and I cringed. Hopefully you don't forget where you parked. Luckily, the lady never turned around, either not hearing him or choosing to ignore his snide remark. All right, Dad, let's hurry up and get you home so you can stop being a menace to society. I smirked and looked at the cashier but she just scowled at my dad. She took her sweet time ringing up the beer, probably trying to annoy him after his rude outburst. She asked to see his state ID. He flipped his wallet toward her, but then she stated that he needed to take the ID out and hand it to her. 
sighing in dramatic fashion, he did as she requested. Having paid for the beer, receipt in hand, my dad rushed toward the exit. I sulked after him, embarrassed to be associated with him in public. The cool oasis of the store was ripped violently away as the scorching summer sun hit my body. I slipped on my sunglasses and looked over at our car. My dad did the same. Shit, come on, he said, picking up his pace. We can make it out of here before we get stuck behind that old geezer again. The elderly lady had just sat down in the driver's seat of her tank of a car and closed the door. She had parked right next to us. Reaching our vehicle, my dad tossed the beer cases into the back seat. The bottles jostled so loudly that I thought God must have given us a miracle to keep them from shattering. I opened the passenger door and got in, but we were too late. The little old lady started creeping her car backward while straining her eyes at the side view mirror. Oh, no you don't, my dad yelled while jamming his key into the ignition. He put the car in reverse and pressed the gas pedal down hard enough to make the tires squeal. The little old lady jumped in her seat as my dad cackled with laughter. Have a nice day, he screamed this last bit through his window, which was still cracked to keep the car from becoming an oven while we were inside the store. I know that this might seem like an extreme example. And maybe it is. But this type of behavior was a pretty common occurrence with my dad. And would you believe he was in church that Sunday? I'm not saying that he would constantly go out of his way to accost little old ladies. But the principle of the matter is that he was selfish and rude. Seeing as he was a self-professed religious man, his behavior left a lot to be desired. I tell you all of this to illustrate the massive and haunting changes that overtook my dad during the next few months. Chapter 2 Mom died a little less than a year ago. She had a severe heart attack while sitting at her desk in a lonely office building. There were no signs or warnings, and her doctor told us later that sometimes these things happen as if that was supposed to make us feel better. Our family was absolutely devastated, with my little sister taking it the hardest. Lucy is eight years old, and I can't imagine what type of trauma losing a parent does to a child her age. I've always been close to her, but she's grown cold since mom passed. Colder still, since she experienced the nightmare no child should ever experience, not long after we buried mom. She was never a daddy's girl before, but that's all changed. My dad has started working from home, and she is homeschooled, as she has crippling panic attacks if she is away from him for too long. My counselor said it's an extreme form of separation anxiety and PTSD. I can't blame her, but it absolutely breaks my heart to see her that way. After mom died... I was worried that dad would resort to unhealthy ways of managing his grief. I even toyed with the idea of moving back home for a bit to help keep an eye on him, but I had just renewed my apartment lease and didn't want to put my roommate up shit creek without a paddle. My dad's brother is an alcoholic and a religious nut, and their late father was a womanizing sex addict. But Dad didn't turn to any of the chemical or hormonal devices that so often grab hold of men in grief. There was the bit with his brother, but nobody could have known that would happen. I'm still wrestling with whether I should even write it down. Not yet. Overall, I was proud to see my dad take what I believed to be the higher road. Oh, how wrong I was. Now... As I mentioned before, his church attendance has always been stellar, but after Mom died, he actually began participating. He dusted off his old Bible and began lugging it to church with him. He volunteered at his church's soup kitchen and even donated all of Mom's old jewelry to a local women's shelter. He would share Bible verses and Christian music with me through daily texts. Whenever I came over for dinner which was usually twice a week since mom died, 
He would make us all hold hands and pray before picking up our utensils. His faith even seemed to grow stronger after the ordeal with Lucy and his brother. Around this time, one of his neighbors invited him to watch a local church's upcoming revival meetings, which were going to be streamed online because of the pandemic. Say what you will about my dad, but he is loyal to a fault, and felt that what some call church hopping, even if it was just online, was akin to cheating. He told me he'd turned down his neighbor's offer, but then the next day he received a flyer in the mail. It was an open invitation to watch said church revival, and my dad took it as a sign from God. Call it a lack of faith, but I just thought it was coincidence. I've since come to refer to it as fate. He sent me a picture of the flyer, and I thought it was a bit sensational with the typical Christian end-time imagery. The faces of world leaders were depicted in front of a background that consisted of what looked like acid rain, a nuclear mushroom cloud, and men in hazmat suits. Emblazoned across the top were the words, God's Spirit is being poured out now. Come join us and be prepared for last day events. The church was called Slain Lamb Ministries, which I found to be just a bit morbid for my liking. I realize that many Christians and seekers eat this kind of stuff up, especially during these perilous times, but I don't think fear is a good motivator. My type of religion tends to focus more on God's love and forgiveness, but to each their own. My dad asked if I'd like to come watch with him and Lucy, but I politely declined. I can't even remember what excuse I gave him, but he seemed satisfied and didn't push it any further. My concerns began about a week into the revival series. They were having meetings four nights a week, and my dad had watched each one. My sister then called me, which was a surprise in and of itself. As I mentioned before, after mom died, my sister closed herself off to pretty much everyone but dad. It was about 7.30 in the evening, and I was washing dishes in the kitchen when my cell phone rang. Hey, Lucy, what's up? I'm scared, Billy. Her voice was quivering. I instantly knew something was wrong because she used my name. Ever since she learned to talk, she'd been calling me Big, which I can only assume was short for Big Brother. I've never actually asked her. What are you scared of? I asked. I don't like the loud talking man from those church videos. He stands and yells from his Bible, she said. Oh, he must be the preacher. How does Dad feel about him? Daddy made fun of me for being scared. He said that I'm always safe with him. This last comment made my blood boil. That was the last thing he should be telling her after what happened with his brother. Can you put Dad on the phone? I asked, thinking this whole thing was probably a simple misunderstanding, but also wanting to chew my dad out. No, please don't tell Daddy. I... I feel better now. I just wanted to talk to you. I furrowed my eyebrows, trying to make sense of the conversation. Imagining that my dad was forcing her to watch a fire and brimstone preacher, I rolled my eyes and cracked my knuckles. Lucy, why don't you want me to say anything to dad? Because it's almost my bedtime, and I shouldn't be on the phone. I love you, Big. Good night. And she hung up. I walked into my bedroom, the partially clean dishes forgotten about in the sink. Closing my door, I sat down on the edge of my bed and put my hands over my face. It was my thinking position. I've lost count of the time someone has come up to me and asked whether I was all right while in that position. Thinking comes easier when my eyes are closed. I can focus more on my thoughts without the stimulation of sight. Putting my hands over my face just sort of helps to ground me further. When was the last time that Lucy had told me she loved me? When was the last time she called me by my name? Why did she seem so frightened? And why 
had she felt like she couldn't go to dad with her concerns and fears on this issue. My mind was flooded with thoughts, and a sense of unease settled across me like a cowl, clouding my reasoning capacities and causing me to jump to wild conclusions. Was my dad slowly unraveling mentally? Had he unknowingly gotten involved with some cult leader or religious charlatan that was out for impure motives? Would my sister even be able to process these new fears of hers? I opened my eyes and stood to my feet, allowing my hands to drop to my waist. I had to get out of those negative thoughts or they'd bring on a panic attack. I'd taken numerous steps over the past couple of years to get a hold on my mental state. Because of my natural inclination to focus on the negative and worry about the worst possible outcomes to any given event, my life had been plagued with panic, anxiety, and depression. Mindfulness meditation, daily nature walks, medication, and counseling brought a marked improvement to my struggles. That is, until the coronavirus pandemic hit. For those of you that have been living under a rock, or completely off the grid, the world has been experiencing a pandemic. I hadn't worried much about it when I heard the reports coming out of China in late December of 2019. By the time March had come, the world, and my view of the virus, had changed completely. Hospitals had been overloaded. Countries had been essentially shut down. The rate of spread had grown to terrifying rates, and fear was at a fever pitch. The constant news cycle, whether on TV or social media, was like an overwhelming assault on the battlefield of my mind. I couldn't stay focused during my meditation. I was scared to go outside, and my counselor seemed like he was struggling too much with his own stuff to really give attention to mine. My medication seemed like it was the only thing keeping me sane. Anyway, this was the reason I forced myself to stop thinking of the worst concerning the situation with my dad and sister. I was susceptible and weak. Allowing fear to consume me was not something I could afford to do. Little did I know, things were about to get much worse. Chapter 3 the next few days passed without another call from my sister. Other than my dad's text to make sure I was coming over for dinner, I didn't hear anything from my family. I would keep my eye on Lucy during dinner and look for any weird signs, but I was hoping things had blown over. The drive to their house felt strange, almost as if I was in some apocalyptic movie. The roads were pretty much deserted. Store parking lots were bare, and people's houses were sealed up tight. At this point in the pandemic, our local city had delivered stay-at-home orders and called for all non-essential businesses to shut down. All of this led to my shock during dinner. Lucy, I want to see more veggies on your plate, my dad said as he scooted a serving bowl of steaming green beans toward her. She took her time, but obliged. Everything tastes good, Dad, I said through a mouthful of ham. Some of the meat's succulent juices dribbled down my chin, and I wiped it with a napkin. It had been a few days since I'd had a home-cooked meal, and I was loving it. Lately, I'd gotten into the habit of grabbing fast food on the way home from work. My taste buds screamed in ecstasy as I piled another forkful of juicy pork into my mouth. Thanks for cooking. You're welcome, he said a little abruptly. Son, we need to talk about something, and it's important. Something in his tone created an instant sense of dread. I had to quickly remind myself that I wasn't a teenager living at home anymore. Swallowing my mouthful of food, I said, If I didn't know any better, I'd think I was in trouble. No, nah, you aren't yet. But you could be. What are you talking about? I put my fork down and gave him my full attention. 
I've been doing a lot of thinking, he said. Praying, actually. I believe God's been speaking to me. I laughed. (laughs) You're kidding, right? The look on his face told me he was serious. My tongue stopped watering. I braced myself for whatever crazy thing he was going to say next. God wants me to become a member of Slain Lamb Ministries. I breathed a sigh of relief. As sensational as I felt that church and its message might be, there were much worse things that God could have told him to do. Lucy quietly poked at the green beans on her plate, fishing out the little pieces of bacon and setting them aside. God is calling his people to be more faithful, he said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. We are to start meeting in the church building again. Well, yeah, Dad, I said. Once this whole virus thing blows over, everything is going to be opening back up. This won't last forever. We are waiting for all that. We'll be in the church for this next crusade message tomorrow night. What? I said in disbelief. All the relief I had felt moments before melted away like plastic in a microwave. Now you're kidding. Tell me you're kidding! Don't raise your voice to me, boy, he said. No, I ain't kidding. We're going to the church tomorrow night. We? I cried. You're going to pull Lucy into your stupid game? How about you let me raise my daughter how I see fit, he said, tossing his napkin onto his plate and standing. Dad, do you not see how crazy this is? People are dying, infections are still skyrocketing, there's no vaccine, and you're trying to go hang out with a couple hundred people for an hour? I'm not arguing with you. I was hoping that you'd go with us. When was the last time you even went to church? I don't need to go to a church to experience God, I said, rolling my eyes. That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. He's got a hold of you. I can feel it. Now I stood up. Did you really just say that? I don't think I've ever, in my 25 years of life, heard you talk about the devil. What is going on with you? I guess you can say that I've seen the light, my dad answered, calmer than I had expected. Pastor Aka preaches the word in a way like I've never heard. He's God's anointed. And who are we to deny that? And is Pastor Akka an infectious disease expert too? He's an expert in God's word. That's enough for me. I ain't gonna keep living my life in fear. I couldn't believe my ears. Had my dad really fallen for some whack job preacher? My throat tightened and my mouth felt full of chalk. I wasn't going to win the argument that night. As hard as it was, I swallowed my pride and passion, collected my things, and walked out the front door. It wasn't until I started my car's engine that Lucy flashed across my mind. I'd completely forgotten about her while I was arguing with my dad. I hadn't even thought to look at her reaction to our bickering. Guilt wrapped its ugly hand around my heart and squeezed. Was I any better than my dad? I allowed my desire to control the situation to distract me from focusing on what was most important, keeping my sister safe. The drive home was a wrestling match in my mind. I regretted not going back inside to check on her. My dad was stubborn, but that wouldn't have affected my ability to talk with her. I planned to call her when I got home, but of course, that didn't happen. The proverbial shit hit the fan as soon as I stepped into my apartment. Chapter 4 I'm going to kill him! Whoa, Omar, I said, shutting the door behind me. Keep it down, man. Omar was my roommate. 
We'd been best friends since junior year of high school. He was a pretty calm and reserved guy, but the rage painted on his face as he paced back and forth worried me. His olive-colored skin was tinted with red, and he kept clenching his fists until his knuckles went white. My brother keeps making stupid decisions, he said, quieter this time, but not by much. He's putting my parents through pain and disgrace. So you want to kill him? I asked, sitting down on the small green sofa in our front room. No, I'm going to kill the pastor of his church, he said, collapsing beside me and crossing his arms over his chest. Omar's family was Muslim. Well, at least they used to be. His brother, Ahmed, had recently converted to Christianity. Omar was personally open-minded about the whole thing, but the hurt it brought to his parents upset him. I guess you could call it a sort of righteous anger. What church did he join again? I don't know. Something about a bloody lamb, he said. Slain lamb ministries? I asked. Yes, that's the one. A whole bunch of assholes is what they are. What were the odds? We both had family members that were being brainwashed by the same crazy pastor, and there was nothing we could do about it. Or so I thought, at first. So, I guess that you heard they were opening up the church building tomorrow night? I said. Yes, but my brother's already been up there today, Omar said, the volume in his voice beginning to rise again. He's helping them with setup or some shit. Wait. How did you know they were opening back up tomorrow? My dad's been sucked in too. He and my sister are going up there for the meetings. That's great, he said. I mean, not that your family's involved. Sorry, I meant it's great that we can do this together. Do what, exactly? Go on a rescue mission, Omar smiled. It'll be just like old times. During our senior year of high school... Ahmed, who was in 8th grade, was being bullied by some freshman guys. I'm not sure how it all started, but they would wait for him to come home and ambush him along the way, usually near the wooded area outside our neighborhood. Ahmed stayed late each day because he was a math tutor for the younger kids in his middle school, so he walked home instead of taking the bus. It was the typical high school shit. The bullies would push him down, tie his shoelaces together, or rub dirt on his backpack. One day, they made a mistake and smashed his graphing calculator on a rock. Don't take a math whiz's livelihood. He told Omar what was happening. After discussing it with me, we decided to embark on a rescue mission to teach the bullies a lesson. Seeing as we were upperclassmen, we didn't even have to get too physical to deliver our message. Omar, this isn't like high school. Why not? This pastor is just like a high school bully. He's using his position and authority to boss people around. Yeah, but the only kid in this situation is Lucy. Ahmed and my dad are adults who can make their own decisions. They aren't being forced to attend church. It's a form of spiritual coercion. Omar said, narrowing his eyes. We've got to at least try to talk some sense into them. What are you proposing? Come up there with me tomorrow night, he said, an anxious, excited tone in his voice. Hopefully, us being there face to face, we can talk them into leaving. I've got to work the next two nights, I said. Oh, yeah. I forgot that your job is considered essential during these times, he said using his fingers to make air quotes. I only wish they paid me like it. You know, I've actually been in that church building before, back when those Baptists owned it. I went there for an Easter pageant a few years back. I can help show you around, but it won't be until my day off. Well, damn, he said, clapping his hands together. I can't wait another two days. I guess I'm just going to head up there alone. If I can convince my brother, maybe I can convince your dad. I doubt it. You know how stubborn he is. Omar's brother was extremely stubborn too, but I wasn't about to take the wind out of his sails. He was stressing enough already. You think I should take some fireworks up there? Just in case? He asked. 
Omar's been obsessed with fireworks since before I even met him. We got into some trouble during high school, messing with them while making homemade movies and pulling pranks. Most boys have this strange infatuation with fire and explosives, but then grow out of it. Omar never did. He always kept hundreds of dollars worth of fireworks on hand, just in case, as he said. I had no clue what he would use fireworks for in a church, but I wasn't about to humor him. No, that's a terrible idea, I said. Just go up there and talk to your brother. We stayed up chatting for a bit longer, and then separated to our rooms. I grabbed my laptop and laid back on my bed. Checking the latest coronavirus death statistics had become my newest nightly routine. It wasn't the best thing for my anxiety, but like a cat, my curiosity was stronger than my common sense. We were over a thousand deaths a day in the United States. How could my dad be so stupid and reckless? And putting my sister at risk on top of it? It was infuriating, but there wasn't much I could do about it. Yet. I tossed and turned for a few hours, but was eventually able to fall asleep. Nightmares plagued me till morning. Most of what I remember focused on my dad in a hospital bed, hooked up to numerous machines. Come morning, I simply hoped and prayed the dreams weren't prophetic. They turned out not to be, but the reality was even worse. Chapter 5 the next night, I left work and headed to the apartment. I wasn't allowed to use my phone on the job, so I left it out in the car whenever it wasn't too hot outside. By the time I headed home, my phone was loaded with missed calls from Omar. No voicemails, no text, just 11 missed calls. Being obnoxious wasn't one of his normal qualities, so I'd be lying if I said I wasn't worried. Whatever was going on, I figured it would be best to talk in person. I slipped my phone into my pocket and started the car. Anticipation and worry continued to build as I drove. Once I got to the apartment, I parked the car and ran upstairs to our unit. The door was locked, which raised another red flag in my mind. I was always getting on to him about leaving the apartment unlocked when he was home. It's not that I didn't think he could handle an intruder. But there had recently been a rash of break-ins in the complex, and he was usually in his room with the door closed, sleeping or playing video games online with headphones on. He wouldn't have heard an intruder if they decided to break in and steal some of our shit. I fumbled for my key, slid it into the lock, and pushed the door open. The smell of Lysol and bleach assaulted my nose like it owed them money. My eyes watered and I pulled my shirt up over my nostrils. Omar was nowhere to be found. His bedroom door shut. The sink was full of what looked like water and clothes. I later found out the liquid was a mixture of water and bleach. Omar, what the hell is going on? I yelled through my shirt, coughing as I inhaled. The smell was overpowering, even through the fabric. Moving toward his door, I noticed that there was no light streaming out from under the door crack. Was he sitting in the dark? Had he gone to sleep? I banged on his door. Omar! Go get on your laptop, his voice called. I'll tell you everything over video chat. Just open your damn door. I fumbled with the doorknob, but it was locked. No! He bellowed. Just go to your damn room. All right, all right, I said. A pit was beginning to form in my stomach. I wasn't sure if it was from fear or the fact that I hadn't eaten all day. Grabbing my laptop off the corner of the couch, I ran to the bedroom and sat down at my desk. I lifted the screen and waited for his call. The video chat program popped up and flashed Omar's name and picture. Hey man, I said as soon as the call started. What's going- holy shit! Omar's face was swollen and his eyes were bloodshot. He was- almost unrecognizable. Wait until I explain how this happened, he said. I gotta say, I'm freaking out, bro. Even through the swollen redness, 
I could read the fear etched on his face. You look like you might need a hospital. I feel like it too. Just let me tell you what happened real quick. I nodded, not knowing what else to say. So I went up to the church as planned. The parking lot was packed. It was literally the most insane thing I've ever seen. People shaking hands, hugging, and crammed together as they pushed through the front doors. I finally got in, but not after the greeter forced his hand into mine. It made the germaphobe in me want to scream, but I was there for a bigger purpose. I heard another church worker announcing that the main sanctuary was full, for now. Billy, I don't know what this is, but I'm sure it's going to be big. What do you mean? I interjected. Just let me finish. Again, I nodded. So, I looked over and wouldn't you guess it, I saw Ahmed. He was talking to some old lady, but I wasn't about to sit around and wait for them to finish their chat. I walked over and whipped him toward me by his shoulder. I told him to come with me, and we could talk outside. The place just felt unsafe. I'm not sure how to describe it, but I had this feeling that as long as he was within the building, I wouldn't be able to get through to him. He got all wide-eyed and said no. I told him that I wasn't asking, and then he just went crazy. He was yelling and screaming calling for help. The old lady even joined in and cried out that I was trying to steal one of the pastor's sheep away. I started to drag my brother toward the front door when a group of people ran out of the sanctuary. It was an assortment. There were young kids, old people, men and women. They just straight up rushed me. I tried to run, but that little old lady tripped me with her cane. In an instant, the mob was kicking and punching me. They roughed me up pretty good. And then they rolled me over and... Omar turned away from the webcam and swallowed. When he turned back, there were tears in his eyes. They started spitting in my face. What? I yelled, standing back from my desk. Yeah, it was disgusting, and it doesn't get any better. A chant then started up in the waiting area. In between their spitting, they kept repeating, We spread the plague in Nergal's name. Does that mean anything to you? It didn't, and I told him so. I sat my body back down, but my mind instantly wandered. All I could think about was my sister. Maybe my dad hadn't taken her to the church. Maybe she had refused to go. Omar derailed my thoughts as he launched back into his story. Another sanctuary door pushed open and more people came streaming out. I wiped the spit off of my face and looked up at everyone and their eyes were black. Like they had been fighting each other in the sanctuary? I asked, my intrigue continuing to rise. No, I mean their eyeballs were black. It was like their whole eye was a pupil. Every person that came out of the sanctuary looked that way. So they were wearing some sort of contacts? Or on some kind of drug? I asked. No! Omar screamed. It wasn't some trick! Something crazy is going on there! I can't explain it, but that place felt... evil. Otherworldly. I wanted to speak up again. Explain that he was going too far not thinking straight, but I could tell that he was scared. He believed what he was saying. I opened my mouth. How did you get out of there? Desperate times call for desperate measures, he said with an almost nervous, maniacal laugh that made me uneasy. I rolled over onto my elbows and knees, but they just kept kicking. A young boy and an old lady were right above my head. I'm not proud of what I did next, but I hoisted myself up and forward with all of my might. My head smashed into the under part of the boy's chin. I swear I could hear his teeth shattering in his mouth. My shoulder collided with the old lady and sent her flying backward under her ass. I had an opening and didn't know how long it would last, so I just took off running. I turned left into an office and slammed the door. There was a small lock in the knob, so I turned it realizing it wouldn't hold for long. 
I'd looked around for some sort of weapon, but the office was mostly bare except for some religious books. The people began to push and slam against the door, and I could see it bending under their pressure. Billy, I swear, I saw my life flashing before my eyes. I thought I was going to die in that room. But you didn't, I said. But I didn't, he repeated. The room had a window in it. I took one of the Bible commentaries from the shelf and flung it as hard as I could against the glass. It shattered right as the office door burst open. I ran, jumping through the window without even hesitating. That's how I got this. He held up his right arm, and I saw that he'd wrapped his lower forearm with a shirt. The fabric was soaked through with blood. They chased me into the parking lot, and even started banging on my car once I got in. The angry mob surrounded me, and I was terrified that I wouldn't be able to get my car past them. Busting that boy's teeth and pushing down that old lady were child's play compared to my exit. I slammed my foot on the gas and ran a few people over. The crowd was so thick that I'm not even sure how many, but the snaps and crunches that came from underneath my car made me instantly nauseous. I probably killed someone. But what was I supposed to do? Everything I did was in self-defense. His voice started to rise. I'm not pointing any fingers at you, Omar, I said, trying to calm him down. His face had grown more pale as he told his story. By the state of his red-stained and tattered clothes, it was obvious that he'd lost a good bit of blood. It sounds like you only did what you had to do. They were the ones who attacked you. Yeah, I guess so. I'm probably still in a state of shock. I feel numb. His head started to sag as his eyes crossed. If you pass out, I'm calling 911, I said firmly. Omar! I'm good, I'm good, bro. His eyelids jerked open. I'm just exhausted is all. Don't call an ambulance unless you know I need it for sure. There's no way I'm not infected with the virus now. I don't want to put anybody else at risk. I think I'm just tired, but I've got to tell you one more thing before I take a nap. Now that you know how dangerous these people are, you'll be able to take the videos more seriously. I found a thumb drive in that office, shoved it in my pocket, and sat it on the table in our front room. Things will hopefully make more sense for you once you've watched. I'll text you after my nap. I should have taken my fireworks. And with that, he closed his laptop. And I called an ambulance. Chapter 6 It was a good thing I called for an ambulance when I did, because by the time they arrived, Omar was unresponsive in his room. I banged on the door repeatedly, stopping to explain the gist of the problem to the two paramedics standing by the couch. I ran over and fumbled through our junk drawer in the kitchen to find the apartment bedroom door keys. Once the door was opened... I stepped back and let the paramedics do their job. They were able to get him stabilized, but said that he needed to be taken to the hospital for a blood transfusion and to be tested for COVID-19. Omar was going to be pissed when he woke up in the hospital, but I figured he'd get over it, because the alternative was to not wake up at all. One must make sacrifices to stay alive. My curiosity and desire for answers was at an all-time high, but I still waited to plug the thumb drive into my laptop. I paced the apartment, sweating even though I had the chills, and my eyes were watering from the strong scent of Lysol that still hung in the air. Anything could have been on that thumb drive, but I had the sneaking suspicion that it was going to rock me to my core. Something was off about slain lamb ministries. Really off. My need to know peaked. I took a deep breath and closed my bedroom curtains. The fan spun overhead. 
Sitting at my laptop, I open the thumb drive folder. Over an hour's worth of video files. I clicked open that first video with such ease, not knowing that by the last video, it would take every bit of strength and self-control to keep going. The images that flashed across my screen took something from me, deep down in my soul. I can't even find the right words to describe the type of horror that gripped my heart with each clip I watched. Pastor Akka was a nightmare of epic proportions, but I knew that I was willing to save my sister or die trying. I called in sick for work the next day and spent my hours preparing for the monumental task ahead of me. One more good night's sleep. Who was I fooling? Then I'd put my plan into action. As I stared up at the ceiling above me, I accepted the fact that I was in way over my head. Closing my eyes, I truly prayed for the first time in years. I was in the habit of blessing my food, but it had been a long time since I poured my heart out to God. A miracle was needed for me to go into the proverbial belly of the beast and come out alive with my sister in tow. I hadn't even worried about my dad. He was too stubborn and blinded to listen to reason. I was sure of it. Twinges of guilt tried to vie for my affections, but I refused them space in my head. My sister was the innocent party in all of this. She was my focus. She was the cause of the current insane ideas jumping through my brain. The constant echo of my thoughts droned on for hours. Eventually, I slept. The alarm's scream jolted me awake, and my movements reminded me of a quote from an early Stephen King novel. He wrote that there was no devilish conspiracy behind the way a person acted when they unwittingly stuck their hand in a wasp's nest. Their guttural screams and wild gyrations were nothing but a momentary loss of who they were. Their mind took a seat as their physical reflexes gained control. Alarm clocks and wasp nests are similar in that way. People are willing to do whatever is necessary, as quick as possible, to put an end to the incessant buzzing. No thought is given to optics, or what anyone else might think if they were to catch a glimpse of the fight for silence. This was my stream of thought as I picked myself up off the floor, untangled my feet from the sheets, and finally turned the alarm off. I hit my chin so hard on the wooden floor that some blood had dripped onto my sheets. The deep red stood out in vivid contrast to the cottony white fabric. It was a bad omen for the day ahead. I just didn't know it yet. The apartment still smelled of bleach, though it was more tolerable than it was the day I walked into the new craziness that my life had become. I drained the kitchen sink and even washed the odorous chemicals out of Omar's clothes but in his rush to clean himself, he'd made an absolute mess. The couch was stained, and numerous spots littered the wooden floor, while the kitchen towels and rugs were completely ruined. It would have been natural to be angry with Omar about the damage, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I couldn't blame him for not thinking rationally after the experience he'd had. I hoped he was going to be all right. It would be a few days before he got his test results back. I texted my dad, which was the first step in my plan. Pretending to see the error of my ways and admitting that my dad had been right all along was the quickest way he was going to let his guard down. If you can't beat them, pretend to join them. That was my new motto. I knew the whole idea was a pipe dream, but that is what makes hope so intoxicating yet also dangerous. I was hanging on to but a sliver, but that little bit was enough to make me believe anything was possible, and so I just kept moving forward with the plan. When doubts arose, I simply pushed them away. My backpack was full of supplies. 
The day before, I had made a run to the store to buy what I needed. Hoisting it up onto my back, I realized just how heavy it was. Everything I'd need was inside of it, except for the small red pocket knife. I always kept that in the pocket of my jeans. My dad had given it to me as a gift when I joined Boy Scouts. I hadn't stayed in for very long, but I'd used the knife during all of the years since. One time, I used it to kill a snake from the backyard. I'd planned on cooking it, but my mom put a stop to that real quick. Before my dad got home, she made me throw the dead thing out into the pond behind our home. To this day, I'm still certain that my dad would have let me eat it. He'd been a lot cooler then. But now, I was off to save my sister from his stupidity. Because I was familiar with the basic layout of the church building from my visit there years before, I planned to lay my bag outside the men's bathroom window. I'd arrive a couple of hours early and drop my bag off under the window on the back side of the building. At some point, after joining my dad and sister, I would go to the bathroom, get my bag, and start the rescue attempt. It seems silly now, but at the time I thought using bug bombs was a brilliant idea. I would roll them into the sanctuary, incapacitating most of the congregants, while I escaped with Lucy. The gas mask I'd brought was not only for keeping out the fumes, but also for protection against any of the crazy people's nasty biological warfare tactics. I didn't plan to end up like Omar. The mag light was in case someone wanted to get physical with my sister and me. I scanned the apartment for anything forgotten. Seeing nothing, I turned to leave. Bam! A bird smashed into the front room window making me jump. I looked up just in time to see the small, fragile body set off toward the ground below. A dusty imprint on the glass reflected the ghost of its last flight. This was the second bad omen I ignored on that fateful day. I closed the apartment door, locked it, and headed toward my car. Chapter 7 The drive to Slain Lamb Ministries was uneventful. To be honest, the whole pandemic had, for me, been that way. Until Pastor Aka reared his ugly head. The parking lot was mostly empty, except for a few cars near the front that I assumed were for the elders or anyone helping with setup inside. I needed to be cautious but I didn't expect to be confronted by anyone on this trip. Driving the car to the back of the building, I didn't see anyone milling around outside. The sun glinted off the windows of the church, blinding me with its unholy light. I parked against the curb, but left the car running. This would only take a few seconds, and then I'd be scot-free to fine-tune my plan in the hours before the revival began. The air outside was still crisp, but warmer than the weeks prior, as winter lost its grip on the world. I swallowed hard and ran to the bathroom window. There was a moment of movement through the glass, but I assumed it was simply my reflection. Being the paranoid perfectionist that I am, I unzipped the backpack and checked over its contents. Never mind the five other times I'd checked it already, this last time could reveal something important. Those few lingering moments outside the church changed everything. Glass shattered above my head and rained over me like diamonds from the sky. I swung my arm up over my head, but not before a shard nicked my ear. The pain was instant, though not bad. Strong hands grabbed me and yanked me upward, dragging me through the window and into the bathroom. Black eyes stared into mine. I lost all ability to fight back. It took every ounce of focus in me just to keep my legs from turning to jelly on the tile floor. The mixed smell of urine and liquid hand soap snuck into my nose. It's so good of you to join us. 
The man breathed into my face, freshly used Listerine stinging my eyes. We've been expecting you. Just then, a lady emerged from the hallway, her eyes dead as night. She waltzed toward me, hips swaying elegantly. She wore a tight-fitting red dress, but her footwear seemed a touch out of place. Both feet were protected by heavy-duty work boots. She was ready to allure and kick ass. Her left hand gripped a bottle of liquid as her right hand revealed a wadded bandana. My eyes met back with hers, and she smiled. A chill ran down my spine. You don't need to be awake for this next part, she said. I tried to call for help, but she had the wet bandana over my mouth and nose before a scream left my throat. The strong man's hands gripped tighter on my shoulders as I fought to escape his hold. The smell of chloroform was nauseating. It filled not only my lungs, but seemed to seep into every inner crevice of my body. The room spun around me, then went black. I could hear my attackers talking for a few more seconds before I drifted off into dreamless unconsciousness. Douse him again. The scuffling of feet entered my eardrums, while a splash of cold water across my face jerked me back to the land of the living. Though my vision was blurred, I could make out the forms of three people standing in front of me. It's about time you woke up. I recognized the voice of the lady in red. I was actually worried that you might have never woken up. But what fun would that have been? We've got a big surprise for you. Where am I? I stammered. My eyesight was slowly improving. Under different circumstances, I would have thought the lady was pretty. In the current situation, I just wanted to spit in her face. You know where you are, a scruffy voice shot out. What were you planning on doing here tonight, sinner? We found all your toys in the backpack. I looked around the room. It was dimly lit by a small candle near a closed door. It was the only door that I could see. The floor was made of wood, and the room's lone window was covered in what looked to be duct tape. Classy. My arms were held to my sides by a rope around my chest, and my ankles were tied to the legs of the chair beneath me. I could still smell the chloroform stench from deep within my nasal cavity. What sounded like hundreds of muffled voices, all deep in different conversations, floated up from the floor. Are we still in the church? I asked. Why don't you answer my friend's question first? A high-pitched male's voice came from the shadows near the door. I could just barely make out the figure of a skinny man leaned against the wall with his arms crossed. He asked you ever so nicely. I was planning to worship with you all. I lied. Once the words tumbled out of my mouth, I realized how stupid they sounded. The man with a scruffy voice jumped toward me and grabbed my shoulders. It was the same guy who had dragged me through the bathroom window. I don't think I'll ever forget the raw power in that grip. He scowled at me, his crimson hair falling down into his face like a natural war paint. Liars will be punished, he breathed. We know you were up to no good, sinner. The look in the man's dark eyes was one of pure hatred and vigor. He seemed like the type of person who would have been stoking the fires during the Salem witch trials. Religious zealots never seemed to go out of style. I couldn't believe my bad luck. I hadn't even made it into the building without being caught. Well, at least I'd made it into the building, even if it wasn't by my own volition. The situation was hopeless, and I could only blame myself for not being cautious enough. What was I thinking? Wouldn't it have made more sense to come hide the backpack under the cover of night? Why did I wait until today? I switched tactics. I'm here for my sister. Can I please just talk to my sister? Your sister, the man in the dark said. Does this sister have a name? Her name is Lucy. Do you know a Lucy? The red-haired man asked the lady. 
can't say that I do, she said, after pondering for a few seconds. I thought I caught a small wink pass between her and the red-haired man. Well, she's here, I said, sounding more whiny than I'd meant. If you just untie me, I'll go get her. You'd like that, wouldn't you? came the voice from the darkness. Brutus, go ahead and untie him. I smiled, not sure if it was from my change of luck or from the fact that the redhead's name was Brutus. Really? Brutus asked, looking at the shadows. No, not really, the man said, emerging from the shadows. Light from the candle flame danced across his gangly figure. He was much taller than Brutus, but probably a hundred pounds lighter. His anemic figure made me uncomfortable. He looked more monster than man. Walking up behind Brutus, he walloped him across the side of the face. The sound of the slap made me cringe. Is sarcasm completely lost on your meager brain? I almost felt bad for Brutus. But then the tall man turned his attention toward me. His beady eyes bore down into my very soul. That's not hyperbole either. In that moment, I knew there was a god because a demon was standing in front of me. Tears streamed down my face, and my stomach tightened as if waiting to be attacked. He moved swiftly, but then stopped with a suddenness that I hadn't expected. How could someone so terrifying move with such elegance? Why the tears? he asked, turning his lips down into a mocking frown. There is nothing to fear. It's only a small matter of time before you will have clarity. I wanted to ask why I was tied up in a small, dim-lit room, but my tongue was plastered to the roof of my mouth like roadkill on pavement. I'd been a fool to come here without a better plan in place. Brutus looked at a text on his phone and then whispered something in the tall man's ear. It was as if he hadn't just been slapped silly a few minutes before. I stole a quick glance at the lady in red. She had just pulled her phone out too, though I was unsure where she even kept it in her form-fitting outfit. Well, my friend, the tall man put his skeletal hands on my shoulders. We shall be back in a few moments. You stay here and think about your sister. My skin seemed to pull back from his touch, the warmth of his hands pushing through the fabric of my skin. He winked turned, and strolled away. Brutus opened the door, and then all three of them filed out. The lock clicked, and I was wiggling back and forth in my seat, working at the rope and praying that it loosened. I jerked and rubbed until rope burn covered me, wrist to forearm. It wasn't loosening, and the heat radiating from my arms was becoming unbearable. And that's when I remembered my pocket knife. Chapter 8 It wasn't easy, but the way they had me tied to the chair allowed me to reach my pocket knife. I almost dropped it, which would have been an absolute nightmare, but managed to keep it secure between my sweaty fingers. The rope wasn't hard to cut, and I was soon free from my seated position. I crept to the door, trying hard not to make noise on the wooden floor. It was locked and I thought it silly to expect otherwise. I looked around the dark room, racking my brain for what to do next. Voices grew closer from the other side of the door, and my eyes landed on the chair, still warm from my body. I moved quickly, but lightly over to it, took hold of it, and went back to the door. If I pushed my body up against the opposite wall, the opening door would hide me from whoever entered. I waited with bated breath as footsteps grew louder. My heart was racing. I tightened my grip on the chair and lifted it up over my head. Someone was in for a hurting. The creak of the opening door surprised me, and I almost struck too soon. Steadying my arms, I waited for the door to begin its closing sweep. It opened far enough that it came inches from my nose. The man coughed, 
I held my breath and then brought the chair down onto the back of his head and shoulders. The chair broke apart in pieces with the force of my strike. A grunt, and then silence as he dropped to the floor in an unconscious heap. It took some control not to leap around in celebration, but I was quickly able to remind myself of the situation I was in. There were too many trials and tests to come for me to celebrate at such an early time. I peeked out the door, seeing a staircase leading into what I assumed was the main church area. Closing the door with a quiet click, I looked back to my victim. The man was heavyset and balding on the back of his head. He was wearing jeans and a Hawaiian shirt, similar to the kind my dad liked to wear. Upon closer inspection, it looked exactly like one that my dad wore. I bent with my knees and heaved the body. After some wrestling, I turned it over and looked down at my dad's face. Oh shit, I said, just glad I hadn't screamed it. Of all the people that could have come up those stairs, I knocked my dad unconscious with the only idea of mine that had worked. Was he coming up here to save me? Talk me into worshipping Pastor Akka? Had my dad even known that it was me up here? I took my dad by the shoulder and shook him back and forth. His head lolled jerkily from side to side, but he didn't regain consciousness. I took a page out of the tall man's book and slapped him across the face. Still nothing. Though I can say there was a degree of satisfaction that came from hitting him. I'd built up a lot of resentment toward him over the years, but the last few months had laid it on thick. Being unsure of his motives, I figured it wasn't worth it to risk him coming after me once he regained consciousness. I took the ropes I'd cut and was able to tie them together for some makeshift handcuffs. By the time I rolled him back over and secured his hands behind his back, I was sweating. The voices from downstairs had ceased. If everyone had gone into the sanctuary area, it would be a great time for me to move. The room was full of my handiwork, and I was actually quite proud of my ingenuity. Glimmers of hope danced across my mind once again. Double-checking my pocket for the knife, I moved toward the door, less worried about being quiet. If nobody had heard the crash of the chair, then they definitely weren't going to hear footsteps. I opened the door a bit, and peered out through the opening. The coast was clear. An eerie silence hung in the air, and it only seemed to grow thicker as I took the steps. Was everybody in the sanctuary praying? At the foot of the stairs, I paused and looked to the left and the right. The hall was empty. I snuck toward one of the doors that led into the sanctuary, figuring it'd be worth the risk to peek through the small rectangular windows beside each frame. My heart was thudding through my chest, and the quiet surrounding only helped to accentuate it. Right as I was about to peer through one of the windows into the sanctuary, a door opened at the end of the hall. I ran, not even knowing where I was going. There was an open door to my right, so I ducked inside the dark room, hoping that I hadn't been spotted. Footsteps approached, and two male voices mumbled to each other in conversation. I eased my way further back into the room, swallowing a scream as I bumped into what turned out to be nothing more than a desk. Holding my breath and looking out into the hall, their shadows grew larger with each step. My heart pounded in my ears, and I was worried, as irrational as it may have been, that they might hear my heartbeat. Two men walked by without even looking into the room. I doubt they would have even been able to see me in the dark, but I was relieved nonetheless. Their quiet discussion faded. A door opened and closed. Then I was bathed in silence once again. I let out a breath and gasped for fresh air, not realizing I'd been holding it the whole time. Feeling the slightest bit lightheaded, I stumbled forward out of the room craving to be out of the darkness. Hey! A voice called from behind me. Before I even turned around, I knew it was Brutus. His southern twang and slurred way of speaking were one of a kind. Dread filled my every thought as I slowly turned toward him. 
running was pointless. If I wanted to save Lucy, I had to act. My right hand slipped into my jean pocket, the pocket that held my knife. So I guess your dad convinced you to join the ritual. He said this more as a statement than a question. Questions of my own tried to force their way out of my subconscious, but I shoved them back. This was my opportunity to get in without a fight. I'd figure out the rest once I saw my sister. Yes, I said, trying to raise an air of confidence in my tone. Are you here to show me where to go next? Well, I guess I could. Where's your dad at? Oh, he went to the bathroom, I lied, thinking how ironic it was that I prayed he would buy it. He was complaining about something he ate. Brutus wrinkled his forehead and stared at me. I held my breath. Yeah, all right, he said. We can't sit around here waiting for him all night. Pastor Aka likes to get things started on time. He turned and walked away, not saying a word. I assumed he expected me to follow him, so that's what I did. He opened a door into the sanctuary. I wasn't prepared for what awaited me. Chapter 9 The sanctuary was full of people. Every seat was taken, and there were some sitting on the floor in the aisles. They all turned back to stare at me as I followed Brutus toward the front. Their black eyes were lifeless, yet full of hunger. My flesh was covered in goosebumps. At the front of the sanctuary, and behind the pulpit, stood Pastor Akka. He was beaming down at me like I was some prodigal son returning home. There was a twinkle in his eye that gave me the creeps. The room was littered with unlit candles, though the overhead lights were still on, humming with electricity. The waxy stalks were affixed to the corners of pews. Candlesticks were set up intermittently around the sanctuary, and a few of the chandeliers had candles crammed into bulb sockets. Spanning the walls were torches that looked to have been forced through the drywall, sticking out like cactus spines waiting to pierce an incoming darkness. Pastor Akka leaned into the pulpit mic and said, Come, my son, come, my child. You've chosen to join our movement, and we will welcome you with open arms. The sacrifice is soon to begin. As he said the last part, he looked out across the audience and heaved his arms toward the ceiling. The entire congregation rose to its feet and cheered. The noise was deafening. I continued to move toward the pulpit. Brutus ascended the three steps up onto the platform, and I followed. There was an electricity in the air that I, even now, struggle to try and describe. The intoxication of having so many in the palm of his hand was etched across Pastor Akka's face. His chest rose and dipped rapidly as he soaked up the support pouring from his audience. Brutus sat in one of the many folding chairs that were on the stage. I followed suit and collapsed beside him. Looking out over the audience from this angle caused my breath to hitch in my throat. As my eyes bounced from face to face, the wide blackness in their sockets sucked the hope right out of my soul. There was absolutely no way I was getting out of this. I immediately thought of Lucy and frantically scanned around the packed room, searching for her small form against the massive sea of humanity. I saw a number of young girls, but none of them were my sister. Had she not come? Did my dad leave her at home? Was he coming up those stairs earlier to rescue me? I had to silence the questions in my head. This was a time for focus. Pastor Akka motioned with his hands, and the congregation sat down in perfect synchronization. It was as if they were totally hypnotized, each ear soaking up their leader's every word, each eye zeroing in on his every move and motion. 
Tonight is the night that we awaken Nergal, he shouted, pounding his fist on the pulpit. Hail Nergal, the congregation droned. He has waited for thousands of years, but the sun has finally shown its favor. He was worshipped in the cities of Babylon, Assyria, and Akkad. Mesopotamia was his home, but now he comes to America. We are chosen. We are claimed. The seat of his glory is here. The congregation was no longer calmly seated in the pews. They had been whipped into a frenzy, jumping, shouting, and clapping their hands. Their faces were streamed with tears, and saliva dripped down their chins. I'd seen someone have a seizure before, but this was far worse. They were completely out of control of their bodily faculties. Bring in the dunghill and the cockerels, Pastor Akka cried, moving to the front of the pulpit. On his command, the main sanctuary door swung open, and groups of men poured down the aisles, pushing wheelbarrows, serving carts, and anything else that could carry their stinking treasure. Each guy dumped his load on the ever-growing pile of shit. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing in a church no less, grown men creating a large mound of feces in the middle of a sanctuary. It was utter madness. The smell made me wretch. I'd almost come to comprehend that what I was seeing was indeed reality, when roosters ran, fluttered, and skidded into the sanctuary. Their number swelled to over a hundred within seconds. The rank cloud from the unholy mound was swirling around the room assisted by the flapping of wings. All of the sanctuary doors were open, bird after bird flocking in through them. As I observed the madness, a man pushing a cart walked in through a door to my right. He was flanked by two stout men draped in black robes. The cart was covered with a deep purple cloth, a tall lump protruding upward beneath it. I could taste fear in the back of my throat. "'Quiet!' Pastor Akka squealed with an air of delight in his tone. "'It's time for the unveiling!' A hushed silence fell over the room like a blanket. Every human voice quieted, leaving only the chattering of the roosters. Feathers floated all through the room like a wispy fog. My stomach lurched inside me as a hot belch exited my mouth. The slight sting of acid danced along my uvula. The man with the cart stopped right below the platform. Pastor Akka glided down the steps, his congregation enamored with his every move. The cart man sat down in the first row of pews. The two guards stayed near the covered mystery. Everybody rise, Pastor Akka said with an accentuated raising of his arms. The people all rose. He stared down at the cart with longing for a few more seconds. Then his hand softly caressed the purple fabric. His face was orgasmic. Oh, 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 I feel its power through the sheet. It's so strong, so vigorous, so... everything. With the last word, he jerked his hand back as if it had been burned. Are you okay? Brutus said from beside me. Standing to his feet, face etched with worry. Yes, you idiot, Pastor Akka said. I was only having feelings of unworthiness. You are worthy. You are worthy, the congregation chorused. Pastor Akka moved an outstretched pointer finger to his mouth, pursing his lips. Silence again. The moment has come. The time is now. With a quick grab of his hands and a flick of his wrist, the purple fabric was pulled away to unveil a tall, greenish vase. I heard gasps from throughout the sanctuary. The vase looked heavy and sturdy, but there was nothing special or gaudy about it. Pastor Akka laid his hands on it, 
gently stroking them up and down while licking his lips. Realizing that I was holding my breath, I inhaled deeply into my lungs. The stench of feces, body odor, and rooster overcame me. I lost my lunch on the platform. Nobody seemed to even notice, besides Brutus, who scooted away from my projectile. He stayed seated, though, mostly unfazed. Everyone was in awe of the sacred vase. For centuries, this has been the seat of Nergal's power. Ancient magic has kept him safely confined within, his power restricted, yet still more than any mortal can comprehend. But now, we offer the virgin sacrifice, which will unleash our master, giving him back his full power, might, and strength. All hail Nergal! Hail, Hail Nergal, the congregation droned. Bring in the sacrifice, Pastor Akka's voice cracked with excitement. The sanctuary doors slammed shut. The overhead lights were dimmed. Pastor Akka snapped his fingers. The candles and torches flamed into life, guided by some unseen force. Even the roosters went quiet and still. A heaviness hung in the air, making it hard to breathe. Slowly, the main sanctuary doors creaked wide. Two hooded figures stepped in from the hall and held the solid wooden doors open. Four more hoods entered the sanctuary holding a chair up above them. The outline of a slumped body sat on it. The shadows cast by the flames made it hard to clearly make out the face of the person on the chair though it was obvious they were considerably smaller than the hooded minions. A virgin must drink from the sacred chalice. We shall be showered in red as Nergal takes control of her body and is reborn. I was racking my brain, trying to understand what was going on. Were they going to kill some girl? Rape her? Possess her with some demon? I was past the point of rational thinking. The scene unfolding before me was proof enough that anything was possible. A cough to my left made me jump and reminded me that Brutus was still by my side. The sour taste of vomit lingered on my drying tongue. A torch glowed a few feet above my head. The group coming down the aisle stopped near the long cart that the vase sat atop. As they slowly brought the chair down, the shadows broke away in the torch's light. Lucy! I yelled, jumping out of the chair and rushing forward. Brutus's strong hand grabbed me by the arm. I swung around and clobbered him with my fist. Blood exploded from his nose as he staggered back, falling into his chair. My hand throbbed, but I didn't care. The congregation converged into a screaming frenzy. The cacophony of noise in the sanctuary was ear-splitting. I turned again to free Lucy from her captors, but the two vase guards had already bounded the platform steps. I tried to juke to my left, but it was too late. They both collided into me at the same time, putting me at the center of a painful sandwich. The wind was knocked out of my lungs, and my eyes crossed. Stop struggling, one of the men said in my ear. His breath smelled like coffee and mint. Don't make us have to hurt you on this monumental evening. I had no real options. Loosening the muscles that had tightened in my arms, my gaze fell upon my sister, whose head was lolled on her shoulder. Her eyes were slightly open, the blackness glowing from beneath the lids. She was most likely drugged, with what looked to be a couch cushion gripped in her hands. The two men forced me back into the seat, Brutus stood up, wiping his nose and looking at me through a mask of rage. Let it go, one of my apprehenders barked at Brutus. He backed off. Without further ado, let us test the virgin's blood for purity. Pastor Akka withdrew a long blade sheathed to his side. I tried to get up, but the two men were bigger, stronger, and had more leverage from their standing position. Their hands pressed firmly into my shoulders. Dread surged through my body, and the nausea returned. 
The rank odor in the room had been forgotten by my shock at seeing Lucy. But it was back. Shadows flickered and pranced across the congregation. What did he mean by test? Was my sister about to be killed right in front of me? I swallowed hard, trying to keep whatever was left in my stomach from coming up. Don't do this! I yelled. A hand swiftly clamped over my mouth. Silence, sinner! Pastor Akka roared without turning to me. You have sinned! The congregation echoed. Pastor Akka took my sister's hand in his and turned her forearm toward him. He lowered the knife, its metallic curve catching the candlelight. The tip of the blade pushed through the soft skin near her wrist. He pulled the knife away, its point balancing a small puddle of blood. With a flick of his hand, drops fell into an ornate chalice that I hadn't even noticed someone putting out on the cart. One of the hooded figures produced a glass pitcher and mixed a watery liquid with my sister's blood. Pastor Akka took the chalice and hoisted it to Lucy's lips. The pitcher pourer moved her head forward as she wrapped her mouth around the surface of the chalice. Don't drink it, Lucy! I tried to yell, but the hand over my face garbled my cry to unintelligible noise. Pastor Akka tilted the chalice, and some liquid dripped down the sides of Lucy's mouth, but she seemed to be swallowing most of it. After draining its contents, her head sagged to its previous position. It is finished, Pastor Akka said, raising the chalice above his head like a trophy. Nurgal, bask us in your red light. We welcome your acceptance of our sacrifice. A strong vibration overtook the entire sanctuary. A quiet rumble sounded throughout the room and the roosters voiced their concern. A dim white light bloomed from within the vase. It grew and filled the glass structure, spinning round and round like a small tornado. From the pews, the crowd chanted, Hail Nergal! Hail Nergal! The light became so bright that I shielded my eyes with my hand. The vibration ended, but the rumbling grew louder. Then, all hell broke loose. Chapter 10 The white light streaming from the vase turned yellow, and a rushing wind filled the sanctuary. My hair was blown backward like I was dipping into the first drop of a tall roller coaster. Panic overtook the room. No! Pastor Akka cried in fear. This cannot be! She's not a virgin! He pulled his arm back and slapped my sister hard across the face. The noise of the contact was loud enough to be heard through the riotous rush of wind still blowing through the room. Horror! I fought against the two men holding me down, but to no avail. Their grip had lessened upon seeing the yellow light. But they resumed their force the moment I pushed against them. How is this possible? Pastor Akka beckoned. The sound of glass shattering filled the room. I looked up to see one of the floor-level stained glass windows broken. Colorful pieces littered across the floor. Small lights flew into the sanctuary through the window. They looked like fireflies entering from outside, one after the other. It wasn't until one of them landed near the cart at the foot of the platform that I realized what they were. The fireworks went off, their explosions piercing the air. People were screaming, and some of Pastor Akka's minions ran around trying to escape the threat of sparks that sprang up from the numerous charges. I was thankful to now have my scent capacities overloaded with the smell of burnt powder. Anything to combat the noxious fumes from the feces mounds that permeated the room. The lighted wicks continued to fly in from outside the window. As each one went off, I noticed that many were simply firecrackers. Nothing dangerous, but some of them were M80s. 
The same type of explosive that had blown a childhood friend's fingers off when he foolishly gripped one as it fired. I didn't witness it in person, but I remember seeing the aftermath. You won't find anyone as bitter as a 12-year-old who has lost two fingers due to his own stupidity. A strand of firecrackers landed on Pastor Akka's shoulder. They draped over his suit like some professional wrestler's title belt. Before he could remove them, a cacophony of explosions sounded, and the area around his head alighted. After a few seconds, he was able to fling the still-live strand away from him, but then he collapsed to the floor in the fetal position, moaning. The pressure on my shoulders lifted as both men ran to their fallen leader's aid. Billy! A voice shouted. Are you in here? It was Omar. He stepped into the sanctuary through the broken window, slipping on some of the shattered glass but catching his balance before hitting the floor. I had to give it to him. He knew how to make an entrance. The entire room was filled with a smoky haze, and bits of firecracker lay scattered all over the carpet. Yes, I said, stepping down off the platform. Come here, we need to help Lucy. He ran down the aisle, but hands grabbed out at him from amongst the pews. Finally, one of the possessed stuck a foot out and tripped him. Omar fell to the floor, his chin cracking against the cement hidden beneath the thin carpet. Omar! I yelled, but he was already back to his feet. Look out! A massive form rocketed into Omar, forcing him backward into the end corner of a pew. Based on the crack that met my ears, I thought his back was shattered. The man who jumped him was bathed in shadows, keeping me from making out his face. Omar, moving with lightning speed, pulled away from his attacker, jumped to his feet, and proceeded to kick the man repeatedly in the stomach. A muscled arm wrapped around my throat from behind. It was Brutus. My Adam's apple was pushed into his inner elbow, trapping the oxygen from entering my body. I twisted my torso and stomped down on one of his massive feet, but his tight hold didn't weaken. Stars began to materialize across my vision. He pulled tighter. I felt the pressure building in my head, thinking my eyes were going to pop out of my skull. My hand groped out in desperation. It landed on the vase. My heart was beating in my ears. I gripped the vase as best I could and swung it back toward my opposite shoulder. Glass shattered against Brutus's face, and he screamed, sounding more animal than human. He released his grip, and I collapsed onto the cart, greedily gulping in air. It tasted like shit, but I didn't care. A soft buzzing sound filled the sanctuary. The noise grew until it choked out everything else. Looking down, I realized the buzz was coming from the shattered vase. Brutus lay on the ground with pieces of glass stuck in his flesh. He rolled his head back and forth, crying. Each piece of broken glass glowed with a yellow radiance. What have you done? Pastor Akka growled, rising to his feet. You've ruined everything! It felt like I was living in a nightmare. The buzzing from the vase's magic, the smell from the disgusting concoction of shit and smoke, the cries of the possessed congregation, the flickering flames from candle and torch, and the fluttering of the roosters all overloaded my senses. I glanced up and saw Omar on his back, the life being choked out of him. For the first time, I realized that the dark form who had attacked him was my dad. I turned to look at Pastor Akka, who I sensed was coming after me, but was then blinded by an explosion of yellow light. The force that accompanied the brightness forced me up and over the cart. I landed knees first on the other side of it, pulling the purple fabric down with me. The yellow glow in the room dimmed, and then extinguished. Pastor Akka was standing tall, his clothes tattered and body bruised. He looked like he had survived a car crash. The knife in his hand glinted in the firelight. I won't let you get away with this, he said, his voice dripping with murderous intent. 
The electricity flickered back on, blinding us in the light from the chandeliers. Pastor Akka threw an arm up to protect his eyes, and I took my opportunity. I grabbed Lucy and slung her over my shoulder. She let out a lazy groan as I ran up the aisle, her hand still holding on to the small cushion. Within seconds, I heard Pastor Akka growling behind me and knew that he was hot on my trail. But as I looked at the congregation, something had changed. Their eyes were no longer black, and instead of looking at their leader with reverence, their countenances were full of rage. What are you waiting for? Pastor Akka asked the audience. Don't let him get away! My dad reached a hand down and helped Omar to his feet. The curse was broken. Sanity had been restored. The group in the crowded pews, instead of attacking me, turned their ire upon the sadistic leader. He grabbed my sister's leg and pulled hard. I would have fallen if a strong arm hadn't grabbed me. I felt another hand offer balance to my back. Some of the people, now freed from their hypnosis, were steadying me and leading me away from danger. Their hands were firm, yet gentle. I trusted them. I looked back. A crowd of people swallowed up Pastor Akka. The last thing I saw of him was a fist colliding with his jaw. His eyes were locked onto me with a burning hell that still, to this day, gives me nightmares. The pulsing group of his ex-congregants pulled him down into their midst, his stare on me finally broken. Chapter 11 In the hallway, I finally felt like I could breathe. Leaving behind all the assaulting smells, I pushed forward. At some point, I became aware that my dad and Omar had joined me. They followed my steps from a distance, both limping in their own way. None of us said a word, but there was an unspoken unity. We were in this together, and would do whatever was necessary to protect Lucy. Her weight was grinding into my shoulder, bringing with it the awareness that I had injured it at some point during my adrenaline-induced battle. The front doors beckoned me forward like my bed after a long day of hard labor. I knew that once I pushed through them, comfort, rest, and sanity awaited. Omar leapt past me and pushed the left door open, holding it wide for me to pass through. I angled myself slightly to protect Lucy from knocking into the doorframe. I stepped out into the cool night air, the moon's light bathing me in its brightness and piercing through the dark suffocation that had accosted me all day. I trudged along the sidewalk in front of the church building and lowered my sister into the soft grass just beyond. She still had a death grip on the small cushion, her knuckles white from strain. Her eyes were glassy, yet there was a faint recognition there. You don't have to talk, Lucy, I soothed. Just rest. You're safe now. Why don't I take this cushion? No. She shook her head. You may still need it. I smiled and nodded, believing her to be speaking from a drug-induced happy place. My dad loomed over my left shoulder. For once in his life, he was speechless. Lucy shifted her eyes to lock onto his. She smiled. He cried. I hate to ruin this precious moment, came a voice that I recognized at once. But it's time to pay for your sins. The tall man and the lady in red stood outside the front doors. Brutus was behind them, leaning hard on the unopened doorframe. His face was covered in blood and broken glass, bits of flesh hanging like a partially shredded block of cheese, clothes torn to tatters. The tall man wore a smile, his hands resting calmly on his oversized belt buckle. Without warning, the lady in red rushed at Omar. He stuck his arms out to block her from getting too close, but she reared her leg back and kicked her booted foot right into his groin. Omar doubled over, coughing, before eventually falling to his hands and knees. With terrifying quickness, she jumped on his back, wrapped her legs around his midsection, 
and put him in a rear naked chokehold. As she pulled back with all of her might, veins popped out along her arms. She was slender, but strong. I could imagine her putting hours upon hours of work in at the gym to sculpt her body for such a time as this. She laughed into Omar's ear. His struggle brought her pleasure. I rose from Lucy's side and watched as my dad, roaring like some primitive cave dweller, charged at the tall man. Brutus rushed forward instinctually to protect his superior. Pain was written all across his face, but it didn't slow him down as he collided with my dad and both of them went to the pavement. I shuddered at the noise of their bodies hitting the ground. They tussled back and forth, throwing punches, connecting with some of them, missing with most. A guttural sound brought Omar back to mind. His face was a deep red, and he was desperately pulling at the hold she had on him. I was on her in an instant, trying my best to unhook her chokehold. I had close to a hundred pounds on her, but I couldn't free Omar. I pried at her with my fingers, pushed with my shoulder, and even pulled her hair. She stubbornly held tight, eyes blazing. Blue eyes, not black. It was then that I realized this woman was doing all of this not out of some hypnosis, but out of choice. The curse had been broken, but some people were evil on their own. Let him go! I screamed. She bared her teeth and shook her head like a petulant child. Omar's skin was taking on a purple hue, and his face wore a dazed look. I slapped her across the face, but she was unfazed. I slapped her a second time, this time hard enough that it stung my hand. She flung back her hair and revealed a bloody lip. My mouth gaped open in shock as she spit, and I gagged as the copper taste hit my tongue. Omar's body had gone limp, and his purple facial complexion was morphing to blue. He was dying. Without thought of consequences, I pulled out my pocket knife. I flipped it open, briefly seeing the moon's glow reflected on the blade, then plunged it deep into the side of her throat. Her eyes shot wide open, and her pupils dilated, a dreamlike expression in her gaze. It was my first time ever stabbing someone. I looked down at the liquid on my hands that felt like warm milk. It didn't actually resemble the comforting nighttime beverage of my youth. I wrenched the weapon out of her torn flesh. It made a sucking sound like a baby learning how to blow a kiss. Blood flooded out of the open wound. It was as if her life force couldn't wait to free itself from her body. The thick liquid ran down her dress looking almost black against the bright red fabric. She rolled sideways off of Omar. Her toned muscles relaxed, useless to save her now. Her eyes gazed up at the night sky and then unfocused. A gargle bubbled up from deep within her throat and then the lady in red stopped breathing. I dropped to Omar's side as he coughed, gulping for air. Thought I was going to lose you there for a second. I said, putting a hand on his back. Don't worry about it. You did great, he said in between deep breaths. After his last word, he launched into a coughing fit. I watched in horror as droplets of blood shot down onto his gray shirt. I had not done great. Screams filled the outside air. Stop it! Just stop! Stop it! Brutus was on his back my dad on top and wailing on him with closed fists. The power and brutality behind each hit was terrifying. My dad continued to scream with each punch. He was yelling for his opponent to stop, long after Brutus's arms fell dead by his side. Blood was spattering back into my dad's face, but he continued to wail on the lifeless body, lost in a blind rage. I moved to his side, not sure whether to touch his shoulder or just let him keep pounding. I didn't have to decide. That's quite enough, the tall man said. I believe I've found my new disciples. My dad snapped back to reality at the sound of the tall man's voice. I wasn't sure if I'd heard him correctly. Omar sat up, 
wiping blood and saliva from his bottom lip, confusion written across his worn face. Come, join me, the tall man said with an air of importance. Or you can die. Those are your options. He said this last part with an uncaring shrug. The three of us stared in silence, stunned by his words. This man was out of his mind if he expected us to join his cause. Had he not seen what took place in the sanctuary? It was over. The hell had ended. His wicked dream destroyed. We aren't joining you, I said, puffing out my chest. I straightened my back to its full height, but still looked like a grasshopper in comparison to the ghoulish man before me. I stepped closer to him anyway. Then you've made my job easier, he said. His slender hand moved gracefully into his suit coat, then reappeared clutching a pistol. Before I could react, his outstretched arm was pointing the loaded weapon at my face. I was about 30 feet away, yet the steadiness in his aim told me that the distance mattered little. Throw your knife over that way, he said motioning to his left with the gunless hand. I did as I was told, the knife disappearing somewhere amongst the church rock garden. My options had run out, but I refused to let him win everything. I turned my back to the tall man and what I'd hoped would come off as defiance. In reality, I just wanted the three people I loved most in this life to be the last image my eyes would see. I wouldn't let him take that from me. Omar had moved beside Lucy, where he was crouched with a hand on her shoulder. Her head was propped up on the cushion. Both of their eyes were locked on me. Beside me, my dad was standing with tears in his eyes. I'm so proud of you, Billy, he said, voice cracking with each syllable. Take care of your sister. With that, he shoved me to the side, hard enough that I fell to the ground. I rolled over to see my dad sprinting toward the tall man as fast as his massive frame would allow. Don't do it, the tall man said, a twinge of anxiousness in his voice for the first time. He brought his left hand up to steady his gun hand. Last chance. My dad didn't stop. A shot rang out. Birds fluttered from a tree near the church building. My dad was still running. A second shot, and a third. Dad! I screamed with all the breath within me. The tall man fired off all the rounds in his revolver, but to no avail. Upon reaching the tall man, my dad corralled him right below the hips, hoisted him straight up, and slammed him down with a force so jarring that the emptied gun fell from his grasp and went skidding along the cement. In quick fashion, the tall man wrapped his gangly legs up around my dad's neck, at the same time, my dad's hands closed around the skinny throat of his shooter. They were locked in a close and writhing hold that resembled some strange animal dominance ritual. Both of them were squeezing hard. But I knew who would ultimately win this battle. My dad was leaking like a well-worn faucet, his blood cascading all over the tall man, turning his face into a crimson mask. I ran to my dad's aid, but the tall man grabbed me with his free hands and slung me to the ground beside them. My body made a splatting sound as I came down into the ever-increasing pool of warm blood. I punched and clawed, but his legs stayed firmly planted around my dad's neck. Omar! I shouted. Do you still have an M80? Over the grunts and growls from both my dad and the tall man, I could hear Omar rifling through his backpack of goodies. In the past, I'd always made fun of the goofy-looking thing, but now I was thankful. He always had an answer tucked away inside. Within seconds, which seemed like an eternity to me, he was running my way, a few M80s clutched in one hand, Lucy's cushion in the other. The punches I was throwing were glancing off the tall man's face with little effect, my dad's blood acting like a lubricant agent against the assault of my knuckles. Now what? Omar asked. Lucy said you might need this, he said, almost as an afterthought. I ignored the cushion comment as I didn't have the faintest clue what that was about. 
Instead, I answered his first question. Light it, then stuff it in his mouth. I expected pushback, or an excuse. What I got was compliance. I stopped punching, and instead grabbed the tall man's wrist. He was strong, but adrenaline was coursing through my veins. He twisted and jerked, but I held tight. Omar pulled the lighter from his pocket, lit the M80, and shoved it into the tall man's mouth. Chapter 12 The tall man spit the M80 out of his mouth with force. It landed a few feet to my right and exploded. The sound it made is still the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. My eardrums rang and pulsed within my skull. It instantly made me feel dizzy and off kilter, but I kept my hands latched onto his wrist. You stupid bastards! He squealed. Your pops is fading and your reckoning draws nigh. I racked my brain for ideas. The empty revolver sat useless on the ground a few feet away. My pocket knife was somewhere amongst the rocks. Even if I found the knife quickly, I knew there was no way I'd get a chance to use it before my dad died, freeing the tall man to do as he pleased. He'd simply continue spitting out the M80s. My eyes landed on the small cushion. Take his wrists, I said, pulling the tall man's skeletal arms toward Omar. What? Just do it, I said. Drop the lighter and the M80s. He did as I asked without another word. At this, the tall man began to fight back with renewed vigor. My dad was weakening, his choking grip more of a reflex than anything else. I had seconds before the tall man would break free. This was my only shot. Omar, being stronger than me, forced the tall man's arms to the sidewalk. I lit an M80, dropped the lighter, and picked up the cushion. After shoving the M80 into the tall man's mouth, I covered his face with the cushion and leaned all my weight down on it. The tall man heaved with all of his might, lifting us up with him. For a split second, I thought that he was going to throw us off, but then, BAM! The tall man fell back dead. My dad collapsed soundlessly on top of him. Smoke was billowing up from under the cushion, and my nose picked up a mixture of burnt flesh and melted polyester. I puked for a second time, and then passed out, right as I heard sirens in the distance. I woke up the next day in a hospital. The days from that time to now have been a complete blur. Each moment seemed to bring a new revelation. The wild and crazy pieces of the mysterious puzzle that was Slain Lamb Ministries fell into place, creating a strange and gruesome picture. My dad was dead. Ahmed was dead. Lucy and Omar were alive. I'd come out of the ordeal with only minor injuries. My sister, besides the drugging, hadn't been harmed, at least not physically. I am far more worried about the mental hurt this is sure to cause, on top of the recent loss of mom. Only time will tell. For now, I'm simply glad that Lucy is still alive. We'll sort out the rest once we get there. Omar was back in the hospital, but he only had a few broken ribs and would soon be getting his release. It turned out that he hadn't tested positive for COVID-19. I'm still not sure how that was possible, especially considering the fact that the majority of the congregation of Slain Lamb Ministries had the virus. I guess God is still in the business of miracles, and I guess I believe in them now too. From his hospital bed, Omar recounted for me the bits I was missing during his initial medical stay. The doctors and nurses treated the wounds he'd received from the possessed congregation. He didn't have any broken bones, but he had internal and external bleeding, plus some bruising. On his first full day in the hospital, the same day I'd called in to work for laying my plan, he received a phone call. He was shocked and amazed to see his brother's name on the caller ID. When he answered the phone, his brother spoke in hushed, nervous tones. 
Omar said that he wasn't making much sense. He mentioned something about love and a broken curse. Apparently, Pastor Akka's plan was to infect the entire congregation with COVID-19 and then unleash them upon the city. This was all part of the attempt to free Nergal from his interdimensional prison. At first, Omar thought his brother was a raving lunatic, but during the quiet afternoon hours, he spent his time doing research from his phone. Nergal was the name of an ancient deity that had been worshipped throughout the region of Mesopotamia. Nergal's name means dunghill cock, which helped me make sense of the fecal mound Pastor Akka's acolytes built in the sanctuary, and all the roosters that were released. This god was mentioned in the Bible, and his emblem was a cockerel. He was believed to be a god of pestilence, thus Pastor Akka's desire to spread the coronavirus, as he believed it would strengthen Nergal's hold on our city. Ahmed called Omar again later that evening. His voice was still nervous, but in this instance, Omar sensed more fear. He explained that Pastor Akka had gotten wind of my plans to try and rescue my sister. How he came to that knowledge, I'm still not sure. Ahmed begged his brother to come and help me in my plight. It was then that Omar heard a crash through the phone, followed by his brother's screams, and what can only be assumed as his death at the hands of the possessed. His body was found by police in a locked room behind the sanctuary. His neck had been broken. The funeral is tomorrow. Chapter 13 But if Daddy really loved me, he wouldn't have left, Lucy said, tears welling up in her eyes. I know it's hard to understand right now, but Dad died protecting you. I said. I couldn't quite bring myself to say that he'd also died for me. It hurt too much. My dad and I hadn't had the best relationship over the past couple of years, and I'd thought some terrible things about him. This was survival's guilt, but it was something else, too. So, Daddy was like Jesus? I coughed on the water I was sipping. I know that kids can say the darndest things, but this question caught me off guard. I wiped the moisture from my chin. What do you mean? I asked. Well, Mommy used to tell me stories about Jesus. She said that he died to save me. Is that what Daddy did? Guilt of another kind washed over me in waves so thick I thought I might drown. I'd spent years judging my dad and his version of Christianity. But when it came down to it, he did the right thing in the end. He lived out what he said he believed. Yeah, I guess it kind of is what he did, I said, trying not to choke up. So, I don't have to stay mad at him anymore, Big? My heart melted. I was so relieved just to hear my old nickname come back. It may sound silly, but hearing her call me Big reassured me that everything was going to be okay. Lucy would be alright. What were you mad at him about? I asked. She had me intrigued. That pastor of our new church reminded me of Uncle Jenks. It made me mad that Daddy would bring me around him. Do you remember how mad you were at Daddy when Uncle Jenks hurt me? Yes, I remember, I said, shifting uncomfortably in my seat. The truth was, I'd never forget. My uncle's monstrous actions, coupled with his crazy religious beliefs, were what caused such a change in my own faith. Well, that's how I felt about Daddy for bringing me around Pastor Akka. He scared me, just like Uncle Jenks did. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Lucy was staring down at her hands. She never made eye contact when she was feeling uncomfortable or overwhelmed. I remember it so clearly. 
My dad and I stood in the laundry room on the night the police arrested Jenks. I refused to call him Uncle Jenks anymore. We had put Mom into the ground only months before. Dad, in his grief, had reconnected with his estranged older brother. I only remember seeing him one time in my childhood. He showed up to my backyard birthday party when I turned ten. As unperceptive as ten-year-old boys can be on their birthdays, surrounded by their closest friends, no girls allowed, except my girls, Mom and Lucy. It took mere minutes for me to realize that something was amiss. I saw Jenks come in through the back fence, had seen him hug Mom and Dad, but I didn't know who he was. We didn't have any pictures of him up in the house. His name never came up at dinner. As far as ten-year-old me was concerned, my only uncles were my mom's brothers. About the time all of the pizza was being unboxed, I noticed that my dad and Jenks were on the side of the house, away from everyone else. They were arguing. Jenks was swaying side to side, and at the time I thought he was doing some kind of funny dance. I know now that he was just drunk. My young curiosity was piqued, but pizza was a stronger draw. I sat down with my friends, stuffed my face, and the curious sight at the side of the house quickly faded away. Before I could finish my first slice, though, their argument had turned into a screaming match. The next thing I knew, my dad was dragging Jenks forcefully by the collar of his shirt, through the back gate, and out of our lives. I didn't see him again. That is, until Mom died. How could you say that to her? I asked, practically yelling now. Because I believe it, my dad said. The laundry room was small and cramped. We stood almost nose to nose, his back against the dryer and mine against the washer. A hum filled in the silences between our words as clothes tumbled dry within the heated vortex of the machine. Everything you believe doesn't need to be passed on to a child in grieving, I said. I'm grieving too. This thing. And your mom. There's the problem, Dad. You're always making things about yourself. You say shit to make yourself feel better. And this thing was the raping of your only daughter. Can you even bring yourself to say it? I stood tall, seeing as it was your fault. This was nobody's fault, he yelled. This was one of those things that happens in this wicked world. His voice trailed off. I knew my words had hurt him. I was glad. Yeah, that's what you say to comfort yourself. And that God will use it. You make me sick. My dad stared down at his hands as teardrops fell to the linoleum. After we'd learned about Jenks' arrest, we decided to sit Lucy down and tell her. She'd been having night terrors for weeks and we assumed it was because of what Jenks had been secretly doing to her while Dad was letting him crash on the basement couch. We may never know how many nights he snuck up to her room. She still won't talk about it, with us or with her therapist. So we sat her down and told her the good news, that her abuser was locked up and couldn't hurt her anymore. There was no change in her countenance when she heard this, she stayed stoic throughout the conversation. That is, until my dad made the comment. God can use this for good, sweetheart. Lucy frowned, her eyebrows furrowed, and then she grew stoic again. But for those few seconds, she'd shown an emotion. Confusion. It pissed me off. She had enough confusion in her life. Within a three-month period... She lost her mother, gained an uncle, and then that same uncle took her innocence. Later that night, after tucking Lucy into bed, we found ourselves in the laundry room. It was the room that was farthest from hers. My blood had boiled all night, and I was ready to unleash the fury on my dad. He cried for a few minutes, and spoke again, his eyes bloodshot. 
The light bulb dangling above us flickered and then settled. He took a deep breath and spoke. I've got faith that God can take this terrible situation and use it for good. I'm standing by that. I've lived and seen more stuff than you can imagine. Here we go, I interrupted, rolling my eyes. Just let me finish, he said. I did. I've witnessed some horrible things, only to see them work themselves out in the end. I can't explain it. It's just something you got to see close up. My faith tells me that God is behind it. That belief makes God out to be a jerk. He can use a bad thing, but he can't keep it from happening in the first place. I don't claim to have all the answers, Billy, he said, holding his palms out. All I've got is a little faith in my life experience. You think I'm stupid or crazy, but I hope that someday you'll remember this conversation and you'll get it. At the time, I took his comment as patronizing. I feel differently now. I leaned back against the washer, thinking. He clasped his hands in front of his belly, patiently awaiting my reply. The smell of detergent wafted up to my nostrils, and I was reminded of my mom. A rush of emotions took me by surprise. I didn't want to cry in front of my dad. So instead of giving in to the grief, I gave in to the anger. You know what, Dad? I think you're right, I said. I will remember this conversation. One day you'll be dead and gone, and I'll replay this moment. It'll be a blot on the memory of you. I'm done. After that conversation, things were never quite the same between us. I knew that I'd broken his heart. In the moment, I would meant to do just that. The sweet taste of victory, though, didn't take long to turn sour. A few hours later, I felt remorse over using my sharp tongue, but my pride allowed no apology. We never discussed the conversation again, and now I'm the one with the broken heart. It's clear to me now that I was short-sighted. I thought I knew it all, but my dad was right. If I am going to allow my faith to be rekindled, it has to start with this. I never, in a million years, could comprehend how anything good could come from the pain and horror that happened to Lucy. Yet, the innocence that Jenks stole from her was the same innocence that would have brought Pastor Akka's dagger down into her heart. I don't claim to understand it. I struggle to comprehend it. But that's how faith works, doesn't it? It's an admission that we don't have all the answers, and probably never will. I'll never forgive Jenks for what he did, nor do I feel like I need to. I'm not sure what that says about me still claiming to be a Christian, but I do remember something about Jesus claiming anyone who hurt a child should be tossed into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. I guess nothing in this life is black and white. There will always be gray, even when it comes to religious beliefs. It's all a mystery, and I'm okay with that. I believe that Lucy has been given a second chance in this life, and I plan to do all that I can to be there beside her, to help her experience love and peace. All the beautiful things in life that have since mom died eluded her at every turn. Pastor Akka and Jenks are both gone. They'll never be able to hurt you again, I said with certainty. It won't be easy without mom and dad, but I promise to never leave or forsake you. Lucy smiled. She has the kind of smile that can melt the iciest of souls and soften the hardest of hearts. I turned to liquid before her. Then I guess you were like Jesus too, huh, Big? She said. Yeah, I agreed. I guess I am.
Greetings, dear listeners. Thomas Gloom here. Thank you so much for coming on this wild ride with me. I put a lot of my heart and soul into both this story and the audio production of it. If you liked what you heard, then please consider leaving a review for Disciples of Nergal on Goodreads. If you want to read or hear more from me, you've got plenty of options. Check out www.thomasgloom.com to learn about my books and where you can follow me on social media. For an even more intimate view into my writer's life, join my newsletter, Gloom's Graveyard. You'll see the link on my website. If you're ready to hear my audiobook narrations, then search my name on Audible. You can also check out some of the short stories I've narrated as bonus episodes on the Into the Gloom podcast. Without you, my dream of telling scary stories wouldn't be possible. I'm eternally grateful that people like you want to spend time with the work I create. If you'd like to help me continue to weave stories with horror and heart, then spread the word. There's a new face in horror. And his name is Thomas Gloom. Stay spooky, my friends. And please, remember to leave a light on. <laughs>